Welcome to the Wander Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tapon. This is the 100th episode of my podcast. So we're going to celebrate. By celebrating it, how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to do a Ask Me Anything episode. And I've lined up a bunch of questions that my patrons have asked me and some other people as well. And this episode is brought to you by my patri- patrons at patreon.com slash ftapon. So if you haven't done it already, sign up. You can get some really cool rewards. I'll give you an example. My favorite reward is the $25 reward. That means that at the end of the year, you will get actually every Christmas, you will get every $300 worth of gifts, $300 worth of gifts every Christmas. That's a pretty good deal. And in the end, it's stuff that you're probably going to be buying at Amazon or Walmart or wherever you do your, your shopping. And I'll send it to you right to your door. And that's your reward for helping me out. So uh, check it out. Go to patreon.com slash ftapon. Now, let me, ask, let me answer some of the questions I've been asked um, for the last couple of weeks. I've built up a little reservoir of questions. So the first one, I'll start with Tammy. Tammy's one of my patrons. She asked a pretty simple question. She said, I had no idea that Swaziland had changed its name to Iswatini. Do you have any point of reference as to why and were you aware of it? Yeah, well, I, I was aware of it when it happened. And why did it happen? Well, it's the same reason why many countries in Africa changed their names, which is some of them wanted to use it as a symbolic way to shed their colonial past. And so for example, Namibia used to be called Southwestern Africa, which is kind of an interesting name. And so they had South Africa and then Southwestern Africa. And they decided, well, no, we want to become Namibia. When the Congo got its independence from Belgium, they decided to change their name to Zaire. It was based on kind of what the river was called in one of the local languages and then all of a sudden somebody said well that's just one of our many languages in congo so we're going to change ourselves change our names to it was a terrible idea to the democratic republic of congo it's not democratic it's not a republic and there was a neighboring country that called itself the republic of congo it's it's all just a mess they should have just stuck with zaire in my opinion anyway Countries do this, they change their names. And so Iswatini became uh, its new name for Swaziland because Swaziland is what the colonial masters called them. I am very happy that they changed the writing of Iswatini in the sense of how it was written. Before, when it was originally announced, it was a lowercase e and then a capital S, Swatini. And I was just like, God, this is so conceited. This is just such a complicated thing. You know, why, why, why not just write capital E? It's the first letter of the word. It's a country name. Start with a capital. Why a lowercase and do this funny font and all this other stuff changes. Fortunately, Wiser had prevailed. And nowadays, if you go to the State Department website in the United States, if you go to Wikipedia, the official name of Iswatini is with a capital E. So, hey, that's a good thing. Yida asked me a question a while back, and I forgot to answer it. And he said, Francis, from your, uh, first of all, he said, Yida said, thank you. I look forward to getting more chapters for the Unseen Africa. And by the way, that's a plug for my patrons. Uh, for just two bucks a month, you get chapters for, as I write them. And this month I'm working on Cameroon and Nigeria. So you should be able to get those chapters very soon. They're hard, long chapters to write, so give me a break, but uh, I'm doing my best to, to pump them out as soon as possible. Now, he wants to read more chapters. Now, he also said, from based on your experiences, how safe would major African cities be for a Western tourist to wander around unescorted? Most guides say things like, never walk around Kinshasa or Nairobi at night alone. And from most of the travel literature I've read, it advises tourists to soak in the vibe and atmosphere of the people, streets, and markets, rather than to go sightseeing tour for landmarks, galleries, and museums like you do in Europe. So I guess he's facing a kind of a contradiction. You know, the travel literature is saying, hey, go soak up the streets and the atmosphere and all that stuff, and don't bother about trying to find museums, galleries, and landmarks, and that kind of stuff, because there's not that many in Africa in compared to Europe. 
He said the tourism formula of stopping at multiple sites and attractions doesn't work for most African cities. And I, I, I agree with that largely. So, and but uh, he's facing this contradiction at the same time as saying, well, you know, be careful about going unescorted, running around, especially at night. So how do you kind of put that all together? Well, the advice is fairly good. Um, you should always go around at night with some sort of escort in general in Africa. And by the way, almost anywhere on the world, it's always just good to have company at night. United States, even Europe, um, Asia in general, it's just wise to have company. Um, it's just safe, especially if you're a woman. It, you know, walking around alone at night is just asking for a little bit of trouble. But certain places like Southeast Asia, I've heard I've never been, I haven't spent much time in Southeast Asia. I hear it's quite safe everywhere. So that should be fine. Africa is actually quite safe as well. Um, villages, very, pretty safe, that kind of stuff. But just to be on the safe side, I would follow that advice. But I also would want to say, let's not exaggerate the level of fear and the level of danger in Africa. It's really not that bad. I mean, yes, when I was in Kinshasa in broad daylight in noon, three guys tried to kidnap me into their car. They basically posed as cops, even though they had no uniforms on. They were like, hey, this is the police. They flashed some sort of thing that looked like a badge, but it was far away. I was standing a few meters away from them, so I couldn't really see what they were flashing at me and said, hey, we're the police. Uh, come into the car. We have some questions for you. And, you know, to me, it was like, didn't smell right. And so I was like, no, thanks. And they backed up the car. They were going against traffic in reverse. And I said, nope, I ain't going in your car, buddy. And I'm 99% sure that was going to be a kidnapping opportunity that the, and if they really were cops my position was they're going to park the car get out of their car and jump on me and they didn't they just eventually gave up but that was an exception and i I've, I've been walking around in kinshasa at night as well and it's fine i've walked all over in nairobi at night etc just you know when you're walking around chicago at night what are you going to do you're going to make sure you're not in a bad neighborhood you're going to make sure you're paying attention Simple common sense stuff. I don't think Africa is any much worse than any other place in that respect. Somebody asked me for my book recommendations and recent recent books that I've read. I read about a book per week, one book per week. And so the one I just read from Bill Bryson, his latest one is called The Body. And it's a great book. And it's kind of like an owner's manual. And anybody who has a body should read The Body. So that means everybody. And it's just fascinating. We take it for granted, all the things that we're doing, how we listen, how we multitask, all the processing power, and it's done all in this three pound brain or, you know, one and a half kilogram brain. It's remarkable. And we really underappreciate what our liver is doing and what how our cells regenerate and how our eyes work and and, and, and vocal cords and how we process information and, and the touch and the smell and and our feet and the locomotion and our skeleton. Ugh, I mean, it's just all really, really fascinating stuff. And when you read about the body, you start to appreciate the body and you start to want to take care of the body. And that's something we can all do, which then brings me to another question that I got. Somebody says, hey, Francis, I hope all is well. I was wondering, how do you prepare and train for mountain climbing and hiking? I am overweight, done mostly day hikes. The highest point I've ever reached is 8,750 feet. I was strolling through your YouTube and I saw your hike up Mont Blanc, which I thought was really nice, but I'm not sure how to handle this kind of journey since it seems pretty strenuous for a beginner. I've been trying to do lifestyle modifications through diet and exercise, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or tips. And he also said that the Camino Primitivo is on my list as well. Do you have any workout preparation physically you know what should you do before any of your treks and climbs wow great question well first off you gotta start somewhere and i know it's hard when you're overweight you know when i go to the gym i feel like applauding and like giving high fives to the fat people are in the gym because i'm like you know what if anybody's got to be in this gym it's you guys you should be here and I applaud you and I know how hard it is. I see how they're huffing and puffing just to go up a few flights of stairs. 
and you got to start somewhere. And this guy, he's overweight. He 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 hiked up eight thousand seven hundred fifty feet. Great, that's that's remarkable. Um, and now we just got to keep pushing that. So, how do you do it? I've talked about this before, and the basic idea that I believe in is you have to make exercise a non-negotiable side of your life. You just do it every day, no matter what. And that is something like going to the bathroom. You're, it's just not negotiable. You're going to do it. You're going to brush your teeth. You're going to take a shower. These are all things that are non-negotiable activities. So I would just add exercise to that list. And how do you do that? Well, maybe you have to do it first thing in the morning. Because I think doing it, postponing it to doing it in the evening or at lunchtime, it's easier for your schedule to get clogged up. But if you just wake up a bit earlier, then do it. And it's better to just make it a routine. So even if you don't have more than, it's better to do 15 minutes every single day than to do half hour every two days, because I just think it's easier to skip a day. So do something, anything, um, work it into your life and take the bicycle when you can, uh, you know, park farther away than you're supposed to park, you know, get the best parking spot, you know, far away where nobody's going to ding your door. Um, do everything you can to try to exercise as much as possible and integrate it in your life. That I think is the, the best thing. The other thing that people often don't think about is weightlifting. It doesn't look like it. If you've seen pictures of me, I don't look particularly strong, but I weightlift every single day. And I think it's great preventative medicine. And also one kilogram of muscle burns 25 times more calories than one kilogram of fat. So when you have a certain amount of muscle on you, your body is going to be burning calories just sitting there doing nothing, being a couch potato. So that's another reason why you should uh, do that. Uh, also, I like to say, don't turn on the television unless you're exercising. You have to exercise to watch television. You have to do sit-ups. You got to stretch. You got to do yoga. You got to do something. You can't just be a couch potato. You have to. Do, otherwise, no television, no YouTube, no videos, no whatever. You got to do something while you're doing it. And by the way, listening to podcasts is a great way to do it. So, um, and I think, so I, I'm a big believer in doing exercise every single day of the week, seven days a week. If you really have to, you can take one day off. But to me, consistency is key. This idea of doing it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eh, no. Two days a week, just weekends, no. You got to do it every day and it's better to do a little bit than a lot. And the other thing is don't sit down you know, have a stand-up desk. At least half the time you should be standing when you're working on your computer, which a lot of people have to do. Um, don't sit down. Sitting is death. So uh, try to do as much standing as you possibly can. I hope that helps. Um, what are the books I like? Um, I'm a huge f space fan, and so I just read uh, Robert Zubrin's The Case for Space how the revolution in space flight opens up a future of limitless possibility. And so he's the same guy who's been, you know, an advocate of the Mars direct plan as a traveler. I love space. And so, you know, I think Zubrin has done, he's been a wonderful evangelist to try to help people think beyond just going to Mars. I mean, sorry, going beyond just going to the moon, but going to Mars as well. So I hope that is a good book that you should also read. Any other books? I, you know, I'm also a sucker for um, books about war and and uh, just because the drama and life and death situations are thrilling, and so I'm into reading books about Navy SEALs and that kind of stuff. I'm just looking up my Kindle right now, and I on my reading list is Brian Greene's latest book, Until the End of Time. I hear it has mixed reviews. I just finished another book called uh, 2030, Predicting How Life Will Be Like in 10 Years, which I think is uh, accurate for the most part and uh, worth worth checking out if you're a futurist. Um, I have another book called How to Remove the Brain, <laughs> uh, Bitcoin Billionaires. Uh, then there was a terrible book. I guess I shouldn't say anything. If I can't say something good, I shouldn't say anything anyway, but it's called The Good White Racist, uh, you know, 
I'm, I'm just not into politically correct stuff. And so when I think that there's a, 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 a widespread woke movement that is trying to change our way of interacting with people of color. And I think it's gotten to the point of being unhealthy where there's this notion that either if you can't agree, then say nothing. Just listen, acquiesce. You know, any black person who says anything to you, just say yes, yes, uh huh, or don't say anything. Agree or don't say anything. That's kind of like the new woke movement, is just listen and 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 and, and basically agree with everything, which I think is terrible for discourse. Uh, that's a, a, a racist idea that has this notion that white people have nothing useful to say. Like, well, no. I mean, a few centuries ago, or not even a few centuries ago, just 50, 60 years ago, a lot of people believed that black people had nothing useful to say. And that was a racist idea. So let's not even listen to them. Don't even give them a, uh, a, a, a voice in court, in the court system. Well, now we've, we're, we're going the other direction, which I think is also unhealthy. Um, for us to solve our issues of race, we need to have dialogue. And dialogue means bi-directional goes in both ways and so give and take and so i think uh books nowadays are that that advocate that are, are are i think are dangerous and unhealthy i'm reading life 3.0 which should be interesting it's about life extensions and the future of life and 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 how we are going to transcend our biology potentially which is another topic i i love and Africa First is a book written by a South African called Jackie Gil 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 Gilliers. I want to have him on my podcast, so that should be also an interesting book. Um, the Last Stand of Fox Company. It's, a, it's another book that I've wanted to read that's regarding um, military stuff. A Higher Call, another military book. And Why Africa is Poor and What... Africans Can Do About It by Greg Mills. I haven't finished that book yet. Interesting book. Uh, you know, all this stuff is research for my book. And so I can I can see what other people are saying and, and, and see some good ideas, bad ideas, etc. And uh, I'll give you one last book that I'm reading is, well, I haven't started it yet, but it's called Legend. Um, it's by Eric Blim, another war book. God, I'm reading a lot of war books. I never realized how many war books I have. I, get, I go through these phases where I, I read a lot of books that are, uh, about the same idea. I did read The Water Will Come, which is all about global warming and climate change and how the cities are going to flood and that kind of stuff. So I, a lot of times I read books that of, of people also that I may not agree with, um, but I, I just like to hear the other perspective. Oh, one more thing that's on my reading list. It's called The Gates of Fire. It's a book about the 300 soldiers, uh, Spartans, who took on the Greeks. And apparently it's just this amazing book, uh, The Gates of Fire. So I'll go with my last question, which is from Henry Ensley. Hi, my name is Henry Ensley. I'm graduating from college this month, and I have a couple of questions regarding Africa. I have already a trip planned and booked to seven European nations for this summer. By the way, that's this summer, which of course has probably he's had to cancel because of COVID. But I have some questions about Africa. In my life, I hope to visit all the countries of Europe and Africa, but my knowledge about the two is heavily favored toward Europe for whatever reason. With that being said, what are your five to 10 most favorite destinations in Africa? And not to get too specific, but as you like to say, what are these destinations that should be beyond the beaten path? without mentioning common destinations like Marrakesh Market in Morocco, the Pyramids of Egypt in Kenya. I would like to know your favorite destinations in Africa and the countries that most some people may not even know exist. Thank you. So here are some of my favorite destinations. Uh, number one, Mauritius. It's an island nation off the east coast of Africa. Namibia, my favorite country in the mainland Africa. Rwanda is also quite nice. Uh, Mauritania is a little bit off the beaten path, but also relatively safe. And if you like deserts, it's great. I love lo deserts. That's also why I would include Algeria on the list. Algeria is an often overlooked, very safe place. Uh, it's an enormous country. I think it's the 
biggest, yeah, it's the biggest country in Africa geographically now that Sudan got split in two. About 10 years ago that happened. So uh, Algeria is number one. Uh, Lesotho, I love because it's a nice uh, nation in the, surrounded by South Africa that has a lot of mountains. And it's just a fascinating culture and gives you a, a break from the hot climate that often impacts much of Africa. Cameroon is, well, that's where my wife is from, but it's also an interesting country because it has a lot of diversity in it. You have the deserts in the extreme north, you have mountains, and it's all relatively small for Africa. You know, it's the size of California, so it's uh, doable. And you have different cultures. You have English, Francophone. You also have uh, Christian, Muslim, all in, in, in Cameroon, so that makes it a pretty interesting destination as well. A lot of people rave about Ethiopia. It's been a very popular spot as well. Um, and so you, you could certainly uh, do well there. Eritrea is off the beaten path. Um, I don't know if I, it's really for advanced travelers, I would say. Another place that's good for not even advanced travelers, but anybody, Sudan. It's got more pyramids than Egypt. It's uh, very safe and the most hospitable people in all of Africa. Out of 54 countries, Sudan wins hands down. Um, so that it makes it a wonderful experience and it's also extremely safe, despite all the headlines of Darfur and all that stuff. So definitely worth checking out. I hope that's helped and I hope you've enjoyed this special 100th episode of the Wander Learn podcast.